So, it is my pleasure now to introduce one of the most successful men that Volusia County has ever seen. When our committee formed, we really thought we wanted to kick off the Hometown Business Alliance with a bang. We really wanted to have a speaker that embodied not just uh, entrepreneurship and local success, but also someone who knew how to celebrate his success once he achieved that level. So it's my pleasure to bring up Ron Rice, founder of Hawaiian Shopping. Come on up, Mr. Rice. Thank you, Sean. We got a short cord here, so I'll do the best I can here. But uh, I guess the first thing I want to do is introduce my uh, assistant, my able-bodied assistant, Linda Kramer. Stand up and wave to everybody. She is <laughs> former Hawaiian Tropic top employee, and uh, she's a Gator. Okay, she is good enough. A lot of Gators here, I'm sure. And uh, she came down from Ohio, and we, we grabbed her, and she's been with us ever since. And, I, and when I sold Hawaiian Tropic, she stayed on, and she's head of all archives and all the old pictures and videos and all the things that we've done in the past. The unique thing about what I did is the fact that I started with absolutely nothing. I was zero, less than, less than enough. And um, I... <laughs> I was eating a lot of Campbell's vegetable beef soup, and I was, um, um, if I hadn't lived through it, I would never believe it could have happened. So, man, that's, that's the absolute truth. We, um, I, came, I came originally from the mountains of North Carolina in the Asheville area. My dad was born in the Highlands and lived way out, way out in the dead woods of North Carolina. But I had, from that, I had country home values, and um, it was it was a good a good upbringing in that area, and we learned the right way. Uh, went to college at University. Of, can everybody hear me back there? <laughs> we got competition from the back, I think. <laughs> um, well, nothing I can do about it. <laughs> I went to college at University of Tennessee because it was the closest major college to my hometown. And um, I moved to Daytona, totally a beach bum. I think it took me one tank of gas to get down here and I, I barely had enough to even get a car at that time. I worked uh, summer all night and day to, to get my car. And uh, I worked here in the, on the beach as lifeguard during the summers and uh, taught chemistry and physics Coach football, I think my first year I made $4,300 a year, and 300 of that was the coaching football. And so, uh, like I said, I ate a lot of vegetable beef soup and uh, that kind of thing, beans, you know. Uh, I worked uh, nine years in seven schools, eight of them here in Daytona, and got fired six times. <laughs> so I, I couldn't work for anybody. I, I proved that to myself, it was not possible. So sitting on the lifeguard tower, I dreamed up Hawaiian Tropic, and I just saw a need. There was it, the industry at that time was very, um, well, I say un, un, uninventive, really. And I dreamed up the idea of a coconut flavored uh, suntan product with great packaging, and it just went from day one. Just went through the roof. I couldn't, I couldn't believe how it was just a great idea at the right time. <clears throat> I uh, bought a $4 galvanized garbage can. Like I said, I had no money, so I bought a $4 galvanized garbage can, a, a broom, cut the broom, broom top off, uh, took the garbage can, took it to my shop teacher in my school and had him put, cut a hole in the bottom of it and make a little plug and I hired two 11 year old kids to sit in the garage and fill bottles. I bought these glass bottles. And I knew that I could go out on myself on the beach. I was, I was a fairly good salesman. I could go out on the beach and I could sell those myself if I had to. But it took off and just went gangbusters. And these two 11-year-old boys, uh, I think I broke every child labor law there was. <laughs> people, people would tell me I couldn't do something. That, that just made me even more like, no, no, no. You can't tell me I'm not going to do this. It's, I'm going to do it. Prove them wrong. Yeah. 
I guess by being a, a, a stupid, dumb country boy, fell off a watermelon wagon, you know, people took me, they, they uh, underestimated me greatly. Really, really underestimated me. And I played it to the hill. <laughs> it was good. Um, one thing that was a big success for us in the early days, uh, of course I knew I had to get into the, to the stores. I had to get into the beach wagons, I had to get into the convenience stores, and that's the only way you're going to go up. But we had, I had all the lifeguards, all the lifeguards on the beach, and most of the lifeguards on the pools. And back in those days, the, the pool lifeguard situation was really a big deal. These guys could make a lot of money. And at one time, I, I controlled four swimming pools. I had one for a few years, and then I got I start, started adding on. And then I turned it over to another guy, and he, he had like 30 of them. And it was, we're, talking, we're talking big business. I mean, each one of these pools back in the 60s is pulling in like 150 to $500 a day, each one of the pools. It, it was, these, guys, these guys are hot shot salesmen, word of mouth. One on one with the uh, with the tourists that come down. That's how we got our start. Was was uh, word of mouth, word of mouth with these hot shot lifeguards, tanned, looking good. And these guys were the best, and a lot of them sold the Wayne Tropic. The importance of the lifeguards is, is premier in the in the history of Wayne Tropic. But then, like I said, I had no money, so I had to sell one bottle to have enough money to buy two, and then two to buy four, and four to buy eight, and eight to buy two, on and on and on. And that's how it all started. Nobody would loan me any money. Nobody would give me any money. I had to do it myself. And uh, I, I know the bankers here locally, <laughs> they started kind of kicking themselves after the company took off because I'd go into the bank with a, <clears throat> with a uh, straw hat on, a bathing suit, and barefooted. And I make my little zipper zipper bag deposit, and and they look at me like some bum off the street, you know. And so I went to them and asked them for some money to, to make the company grow, and they um, they just laughed at me, laughed at me. So later on, I, I was able to get with a bank up in Carolina, and they loaned me like ten thousand dollars. I was the very first, and it, it just bam just went up. You couldn't believe how much. And I stuck with that bank until they dropped me, and uh, and then I got with another and. I hate bankers. I hate bankers. <laughs> <laughs> I worked 18 hours a day, and, and or more if I could. And and I didn't. I didn't know. I didn't even know when I when I introduced the first bottle of Hawaiian Tropic. I had a Forerunner product called Tropic Tambo, but I had I had a conflict with the trade name, so. I uh, delivered the first bottle on the beach, and I had to do the trade out from the from the Hawaiian Tropic, from the old Tropic Tan. And I'm driving down the beach in my old ready van, and got my little doggy with me, and, and I look up and I see this silver bullet going up in the sky. And I'm thinking, what in the world is that? You know, what are they doing down there at the Cape? And it was Buzz Aldrin and Armstrong on their way to the moon. That was July 16, 1969, and I was. Uh, uh, Thinking, okay, well they're they're on their way. I get well. I found out later what it was. I was I was so busy with the product and the company that I had no time. To, I didn't even know what was going on in this world. They could have been the Russians could have been bombing us. Who knows what? And, but later on, I became real good friends with Buzz Aldrin, and still to this day, and we'd make jokes with, to each other the fact that that. Um, I said, well, Buzz, Buzz said, yeah, I was sitting up there in the nose cone as we took off. I looked down there on the beach, and I saw you down there running around at the beach. And I said, yeah, Buzz, you didn't realize that the, the day before, I sent down a, a, a big drum of uh, sunscreen gel that you could rub on. They rubbed it on your nose cone so you could strip through the, slip through the stratosphere a little easier. You know? He thought that was pretty funny. Four days later, he stepped on the moon. And that's what a, what a, what a history-making thing. One thing, uh, I have a few little things that may give you a little insight to uh, things that could help you with your business, and I know all of you, you're the next generation, I'm the generation gone, you're the next generation, and you're looking for ideas and looking for ways to, uh, to improve the businesses that you started, and I see a lot of people just beating their head against the wall, going in the wrong direction, in the wrong business, but and I see others maybe in the wrong business, but yet they're succeeding, so you just got to work and work and work. There's no substitute for that, that time and work. It's so important to be nice to, to, to the underlings. I call them the underlings. Maybe I shouldn't. But you, you go into a company and they're the, the worker bees, the ones way down here, 
um, you, if you're nice to them, it's going to return to you so much. And that's a very important thing. As I see so many people go into companies and meet with people, and they're just, they're just crap uh, on the, the lower people, and they don't. They're not nice to the right people, and that's that's the the people down below. Be nice to those people. They'll come back, and they'll it'll benefit you. Otherwise, it'll come back and bite you in the butt. <laughs> Well, we, we blew by the competition, and uh, it was amazing uh, when it happened. Like I said, if I hadn't lived through it, I could never believe it would have happened. Uh, we became number two in the world. We sold, sold overall probably over $4 billion worth of products through the years. I had over 2,000 employees worldwide. We, we got out into the world market real quick, and uh, my first place to go was Australia, and then from there on, we just went all over Europe and South America, and uh, a little late on South America, but but it was a it was a big uh, a big hit to get out there to get out and, and be, become known all over the world. Uh, I know one thing I did was kind of a couple a couple of things we did were kind of kind of unique. I know one this is not in my notes. I'm just thinking of it, but uh, we we uh, bought all the billboards in Bentonville, Arkansas. <laughs> Anybody know what the importance of Bentonville? Exactly, Walmart, yeah. We, we bought every billboard we could get our hands on because, see, Sam wouldn't let his people go travel. And they just rode home and came back and rode home and came back. They're going by the Hawaiian Tropic billboards all over Bentonville. And they think that's all, all over the nation, really, wasn't it all? <laughs> We owned Bentonville, and, and we had a few little billboards here in Daytona. <laughs> that was about it. <laughs> and I guess that kind of goes back to um, uh, the, kind of the thing called guerrilla marketing. Um, well, one other, one other thing I don't want to forget is uh, when, you, when you're building your company, and you may want to give a percentage of your company to an employer or something like that. That was a bad thing. That was one thing I wish I didn't do, but I, I did give away some uh, small percentage of the company. And it, as we grew and became really, really worth a lot and profitable, I had to buy all that back. And it was, that's not a good idea to give away a percentage of the company. Give, give people bonuses, you know, when you do good, give them a bonus. That's the thing you do. And then that makes them want to work harder, so. Well, anyhow, <clears throat> the importance of guerrilla marketing. Guerrilla marketing was everything, and, and we, um, we did uh, pageants worldwide. We started in 83 doing the Miss Wine Tropic pageant. We were sponsoring race cars and all this other stuff before, uh, but it was all toward men. It was all um, uh, male oriented. And then I decided, okay, if I do, if I do pageants, we're gonna get not only the women, but the men. The men are gonna come to watch the women, the women are gonna come to watch other women, you know, and they're gonna wanna be in it, so. We gave away big prizes. We, we really we gave like a hundred thousand dollars to to the winner. That was just for the winner, and not not even going down the line. And and on top of that, prizes and things like this. So we did the Miss Wayne Tropic International Pageant worldwide, and it was such a from the day one, it was a massive hit. And many of the girls that ran our pageants for those 28 years have gone on to big big time movies, movie stars, uh, actors, uh, singers, things like this. I could name a bunch, but I don't want to bore you with it. Um, another big thing for us, was, and they, they, this is what I call so-called guerrilla marketing, because it, it, was, it didn't cost us anything to do it. I could do the pageant for zero and put it on television, nationwide, nationwide even worldwide, in other, other languages. We had, we had the pageant in four or five languages going on out there. Uh, all over South America and some in Europe, and it, it was a, it was amazing how, when it took off. And it didn't cost me anything to do it because it paid for itself. It, it just uh, was was self sufficient. And boy, what an amazing amazing thing! Uh, Hollywood contacts. Along the way, we met so many people uh, and were big time big time movie stars. I can, I can name you a hundred of them, uh, but I won't get into that now. We made a lot of Hollywood contacts. We did a lot of celebrity charity events. We were, we were involved in about every year about 13 charities, and uh, we made we made one way or another we made big money for these charities. I had another company. I couldn't get uh, uh, there was a, there was a thing called product placement out there. You know what it is, and, but back then nobody knew what it was. 
And, and I kept having these people come to me, and there were little companies starting up out in Los Angeles. And I know back in the old days, uh, when I'd never been to LA, I just heard about the Beach Boys were singing songs, and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, one day maybe I'll get to go to Los Angeles. Well, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? So, but anyhow, um, I formed a company. Uh, I stole two top girls away from another company, and, and they just blew it open. It's called the Catalyst Group. Well, being in chemistry background, I was, uh, catalyst means we make things happen, and that was our slogan. We're the catalyst group, we make things happen. And the catalyst group, we had 40 employees, and this is just a separate company that I had out in Los Angeles. And uh, we had two big warehouses, and we represented over 100 companies <clears throat> that had, we had like Keebler Crackers, we had uh, Nissan cars, we had computers and typewriters, and just about anything you can think of. And we had people that would sit and read scripts and just, just say, we can put a typewriter here, we can put a computer over here, we can put a car here, we can do this and this and this. And then I had other people that would go on with sets and meet with the uh, prop masters. The prop masters are most important. Once you, you give them a few little goodies, you know, you give them a, a computer or something, you know, and, and it's all provided by the companies that we represent. And these companies would pay us twenty to $100,000 for us to represent them, and they got their money's worth time and time and time over again. But the Catalyst Group did good, and finally the two girls that were running it got in a big fight, they couldn't stand each other. <laughs> they, were, they were arguing over what kind of chandelier they were gonna buy for the thing, and I said, oh, get out of this. We sold the company, and each of us made, I think we made half a million each, and, and we, um, Hawaiian Tropic was perpetuated for six years with this new company to carry on and put us in. They put us, we run 100 movies a year. We run like one every three days. Movies or TV shows. You just see it pop up everywhere. That's guerrilla marketing. Now that is that, that turned out to be one of the smartest things I ever did. Uh, let's see here. The Cannes Film Festival. We, we, go, we go to the Cannes Film Festival and take a bunch of girls from the pageant. And we just have a big time. Go down to South France and we go. The first, the first people didn't, they, they look at us like, you're, you're, what are you doing here? You don't have a movie, you're not doing anything with the movies. So it doesn't matter, we're here, we're, we're gonna go party with you. And so, <laughs> so that's what we did. We went, we went there and uh, we, we met so many celebrities by being at the Cannes Film Festival, just, just being there. You know, and they invite us, invite us to all the parties. They want, they, want, they want to see the girls, they want the girls to come to the party. So we had no problem at all. <laughs> I know one time, uh, one time we were going uh, invited to a party with uh, Michael Douglas, and uh, it was a Sharon Stone movie premiere party, and it was held at a fi the only five star restaurant in Cannes, and we, we were told what time to be there, and they said the dinner will be over, and then you can come on in and you can just have drinks and meet everybody. Well, we got there right on time, and they hadn't even started dinner. And we we walked right down through the middle of the whole thing. It was like like. 12 to 15 tables, big circular tables, 16 people at a table, left and right. And we got all the way to the end. And then the girls turned around. These girls were dressed to the max. I mean, they looked beautiful. They were they were some of the most beautiful women in the world. And they turned around and turn around. They, they start pushing me out, going back. We had to go out. So I get outside and I get this big hand on my shoulder, like, oh, like this. I look around. It's Michael Douglas. And he says, now that was the greatest entrance I've ever seen. <laughs> you get those girls and get back in there right now. <laughs> we, we've been great friends ever since. <laughs> um, we did uh, Le Mans, uh, the race at Le Mans, probably the biggest racing, uh, one, one single event in the world and I, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Le Mans is in France, it's about 150 kilometers southwest of Paris. And, we went there for many, many years. We won the first two years. In fact, we had Paul Newman driving for us the second year we were there. And we won two years in a row, and we thought all we had to do was go, and then we hadn't won since. <laughs> but that's the way it goes. Um, auto racing, NASCAR, we were in NASCAR from the early days. We had uh, drivers like Neil Bonnet, who was our very first driver, who, who some of you know, and most of you don't, but he was a great driver. He came out of the, Hueytown, Alabama group with Donnie Ellison became our driver right after him, five years. And then after that was uh, uh, David Pearson for a year. We won our very first race up at Darlington with him. 
And then we had Harry Gant and Stan Barrett driving, and then uh, we, we finally got out of it. We figured we'd done our good in there. We, we, it didn't cost us much. Yeah. The money we put into that, you, you couldn't even buy the tires for one race for the, with the cars in today's world. It's just a whole other whole other game. More guerrilla marketing. Um, I guess I was very, very lucky, uh, extremely lucky. I've always been very lucky. I wouldn't change a thing. I sold the company in 07. That was right before the crash. Three months later, the crash came. And had they known the crash was coming, I don't think they'd have, they would have paid the kind of money they paid, they paid me. Um, started in Daytona, ended in Daytona. From, from back in the 60s to 07. Um, I've traveled all over the world, but Daytona Beach is a place you're living in, the best place you could possibly live, really, serious. I, I live here, I've, I've got my home here, I've got my animals here, I've got my, one of my friends here, and um, right back here is Andy standing there in the black dress, and she was our nanny for three years. My, my daughter's 21 now, and she's going to Portland State University, and, and Andy came over from England. England? England, England, yeah, we had, a, we had a South African nanny, we had a Scottish nanny, but we had a bunch of English nannies. We still can't understand what they say, but, uh, <laughs> but Daytona Beach is a place. You're living in a great place, so, so believe me. Uh, there's going to be a book and a movie about Orange Tropic. It's already in the works. Uh, the book is, uh, I'm going to be using a script, script writer out of New York City, and the the movie, of course, will come out of Los Angeles. The people that did the movie um, um, about the girl that got her arm bit off of the shark, what was it called? Soul Surfer. Soul, Soul Surfer, yeah, they're, they're gonna do the movie. Uh, they asked me about that. I, I told them I, I like Matthew McConaughey myself. Yeah, we'll Or maybe, maybe Owen Wilson, how are you? <laughs> Either one, either one of those two. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, that's all I got to say. Anybody got any questions? Really? This is question time. No questions. Okay. What would you have done different? You know, you know, I think about that, and uh, I'm, I'm a, a staunch uh, Southern hillbilly. Um, if I'd been around the time of the Civil War, I'd been right there in the middle of the Confederacy. But I think about it now in today's world, and I think, boy, what if, that, what if the South had won the war? I wouldn't even be here. <laughs> I wouldn't be, if anything, that's not my point is, I would, I would never change anything because if you change any one little thing as you're on your way up, it changes everything. It's like the butterfly effect, you know the movie? Remember? It's much like that, and if I changed any one little thing, it could, it could have just, make, just multiplied and changed everything. So nothing really. Yeah. Seems like at some point money wasn't really motivating you. So what was your biggest motivation? Well, once once I realized I had a tiger with a tail, I had that that idea, and that that product was going. And that's, that's what motivated me, really. I, I said, just see how far you can take this, to see where, where you can go with it. And I knew it was kind of, and of course, money was a motivation, of course, you know, because I was eating beans. And, uh, and, and I didn't, my philosophy was, you don't spend a penny unless it brings you a return. And I didn't spend anything. I mean, I was, I was, a, I was the cheapest one out there, I guess you might say. <laughs> yeah. No, I knew I knew nothing about it, I, and I, I had I had help along the way from people that knew knew those kind of things, like building displays. And, right, the, yeah, she wanted to know. She she heard that you should do something you know, but she didn't think that I knew anything, and I didn't. I didn't know a thing about it. I knew nothing about marketing. I knew no, I knew nothing about marketing at all. And I, and I was, uh, I, I had nobody to help me. It was just me and two 11-year-old kids and my little dog, my little greenie dog. 11 year And the greatest dog in the world. But uh, we, we went to, I'll give, you, I'll give you one little funny story. There was a beach uh, shop in Daytona called Craig's Beach Shop. I don't know whether they're still around or not. 
but there was a father and son, and they would not take my product. They had the best gift shops in the whole town, and they would not take my product. So I'm standing out on the beach one day, and I see these girls come down with their Ohio State sh jackets and shirts on, and the light bulb went off, and I went, okay, here's my chance. I said, you girls, come with me tonight for about 30 minutes, and I'm going to give you enough suntan lotion to last all of you and your friends for the whole summer. And they go, oh yeah, we'll do that. So we got in the car and we rode down to the gift shop and I stood outside hiding behind a palm tree looking in the window. And uh, this one guy gave this one girl a bottle of the most expensive oil we had at the time. It was called professional oil and it was about maybe half full or a little less. And so, so, so she put in all her, her uh, big hat, the big Mexican hat up there and the alligator says Florida on it and all this stupid stuff that tourists buy. And so, so she pulls out this bottle and she goes, uh, let's see, and I need uh, six bottles of this. And she goes, well, oh, back, uh, Jamie wants one of those bottles, doesn't she, back in the dorm? And she goes, yeah, one for Jamie. Okay, I'm making seven. And then, and this guy doesn't have it. And he's, he's, he's bringing up bottles of copper dung, just one after another, just bringing them. She goes, oh, no, no, we don't use that crap. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so we leave and I take them back to the hotel, give them a big supply of products. I go back to my house and the phone's ringing off the hook. <laughs> and this guy is just, oh, he's just cussing me out. He said, you're the worst salesman in the world. What are, you're, what, you never come around. I said, I do not come around. No, no, you never come around. You're the worst. I go, okay, yes, sir, I'm the worst. He says, I'll, I'll be down to see you tomorrow and see what we can do. And he goes, no, 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 you come down tonight. You come down here. <laughs> so, so from that point on, we set up a big display in each of their two stores, one on North Atlantic, one on South Atlantic, and they sold out in a week. And they, they were just, just went crazy. And they couldn't believe it. And they were, I was their best friend after that. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Anybody? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> fantastic success story. I tell you, I'm, I'm picturing two 11-year-olds with a galvanized trash can and a broomstick. I mean, it just goes to show, if you have the passion and the persistence and that guerrilla marketing mindset, you can accomplish virtually anything in life. I mean, I'm sure a lot of uh, what Mr. Rice said resonated with you. I mean, how many of you have gone to the bank for a loan and felt like the bank only wanted to lend people that had money money? And how many times have you tried to take your product to someone and uh, they haven't quite seen the value in it yet until all of a sudden it explodes and then everybody wants it? So what a great success story. And that's what we're all about. We're all about helping you succeed.